Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Morteza Degani, and I would like to thank you for coming here. I would like to welcome you to the Camilleri Hall at the Brain and Creativity Institute. Uh, so today we have our first speaker in the Big Data and Human Behavior Speaker Series. As I mentioned in the many emails that I sent you all, uh, the goal of this speaker series is twofold. First, we would like to invite people who are leaders in this field, such as Matthias, uh, to come here so we can know their work better, but also to bring people across the university who are interested in using uh, alternative uh, methods for understanding human behavior and cognition uh, closer together. Uh, so far, we have two more speakers uh, uh, for the series in this academic year. We have Tom Mitchell and Olaf Sporns. Uh, Tom will be visiting us in December and Olaf uh, in March. Uh, I would like the fourth speaker to come from industry, if possible. If you guys have any suggestions, uh, please let me know after the talk. Uh, before I introduce Matthias, I would like to thank Wendy Wood, who is not here. Uh, for supporting the series and making it happen. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Antonio and Hannah Demazio for allowing us to use this uh, beautiful auditorium. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Matthias Mel with us today. Matthias received his PhD in psychology from University of Texas. Uh, after that, he joined the faculty of the University of Arizona Psychology Department, where he's now an associate professor. He's also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Communication, an associate investigator at the Arizona Cancer Center, and an affiliate faculty at the McKnight Brain Institute. Over the last decade, Dr. Mel has developed and validated the electronically activated recorder, which I think he's gonna uh, talk to us about, about it today, as a novel methodology for the unobtrusive naturalistic observation of daily life. His research has been published in various high impact journals, including science, psychological science, and many other venues that many of us dream of publishing in. Um, as a result, in 2011, APS identified him as a rising star in the field of psychology. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Matthias Mel. Thank you very much for this kind introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. This has been a very special invitation. I've had a wonderful time visiting here. It's, it's a great idea exchange. Um, there's, there's so many connections and so many levels across um, academic departments and, um, and fields. Um, I feel humbled to speak as the opening speaker for this series and I feel humbled to speak for big data because I still consider my data relatively little. Um, compared to what other people have. But I do think we, we um, particularly the human behavior part, I think um, we can talk a lot about that. So the title of my talk is Conducting Behavioral Observation Research in the Real World, um, Mobile Sensing with the Human Ear. Um, and um, I'm gonna review what we've done so far with um, this observation methodology and, and where we're going. So when you look at methodologies in, in the social sciences, you can, you can come up with a very simple method matrix. This is um, mostly for conceptual reasons. Um, you, can, you can categorize methods by where the data is being collected in the laboratory or in the natural environment, and you can categorize them by whether the mode um, of data collection is self-report or behavioral observation. Um, of course, there's also physiological me measures that I have excluded for the moment. And most of what psychology draws on, and for good reasons, because it's very efficient and, and effective and gets a lot, is um, the, the global um, self-report. So we bring participants in the lab, they complete a self-report, and we get a lot of information. We, um, we know that this is only part of the story, and that's why observational researchers bring mother-child diets in the lab, um, parents in the lab, relationships in the lab, and there's many researchers um, here in, in, in the auditory who have, have a long history of doing that because there's some things that you cannot get at with self-report. So that is um, behavioral observation. Um, beginning with the 70s, um, researchers um, realized that um, it's slightly lopsided if you only bring participants to the lab, that we also need to really go out and bring the lab to the participants. And, and again, USC um, ha has people who were instrumental in that, Noah Schwartz is there, Arthur Stone um, is, I believe, not here at the moment, but he was obviously uh, foundational um, with respect to ecological momentary assessment. 
And the idea was that we collect um, self-report in information in the moment. So it used to be um, these wristwatches, then it used to be Palm Pilots, and, and now it's smartphones. The idea is the same. You prompt participants, how do you feel right now? Tell me. Are you stressed? Are you happy? And so on. But what we see from this matrix is that the lower right quadrant, um, behavioral observation in the natural environment, is um, surprisingly empty. And that is surprising because when you ask, um, when you ask people what psychologists do, they observe people, right? And it turns out we actually do not really observe people very often, and particularly not in the naturalistic environment. And this is where I think mobile sensing can make a huge impact in filling the gap, and this is where we have attempted to, to begin to fill this gap over the last 10 years. So the methodology that, that we've developed is an acoustic observation sampling method, if you want. So we call it um, the ear because, of course, it makes a nice acronym, the electronically activated recorder. And the idea is very simple. We give people a tape recorder. It used to be an analog tape recorder. Um, then it became digital. Now it's an iPhone app. And the app records for short periods of time, thin slices of time, 30 seconds usually, um, intermittently throughout the day. So participants get the device, don't do anything else other than pursue their daily activities, come back to us. We get essentially an um, acoustic diary, acoustic log of a person's day as it naturally unfolds. And that is our, our input. That's what we work with. So when you record 30 seconds about five times an hour, you um, record 5% of the day. This is important because there's, of course, privacy considerations, so we can talk about that extensively. But first and foremost, 95% of the, of, the, of the day are private in the first place. There is no intrusion. And for the remaining 5%, we provide participants with the opportunity to review their sound files and delete any file um, that they would want to have deleted. Um, what kind of information do we get? I think it may, it may help, rather than me talking about it, it may help if I play you a couple of sound files. So this is um, a sound file of everyday life in um, a college town. Does this work? Where are we at? Where are we going? Uh, Rooster. I live on Rooster Street. So what we see from this, this is actually not, not even 30 seconds. This is cut down for presentation purposes. There's a lot of information contained on there. We know the person is outside, cars passing by. We know there's an, uh, probably another person there. A person is singing, and if we made a, if we made a, a, a poll, we probably would, most of us would agree that the person is in a good mood, all of which is important psychological information. The question, of course, is do we also get um, aspects of daily life that get, get more at, at the emotional part? And, and so um, here's an example of emotional life um, within a family. That's why I thought it was OK. No, I didn't see mom do it. I didn't see mom do it. I said, mom, should I set the cruise control at 80 all the way home? She's like, that's fine. And if she says anything different, it's a lie, because you don't ever test my memory. My memory is perfect. Dr. Massey, would you agree with that? <laughs> um, so I present this sample because, of course, it evokes a laugh. But I think it's also important because you hear from the way the person talks that the person talks pretty naturalistically, pretty, um, pretty normal. And that also corresponds to our own experiences. The question is, how obtrusive is this? You put a recorder on people. How much do people notice? Well, people are aware of it, at least initially. So you put the, the recorder on people. People know there's a chance of being recorded. They never know exactly why. But I think in the end, I can tell you that you habituate pretty quickly to it, but it's, it would be better if we had data. We have self-reported information, how much they're bothered by it, and how much people around them notice, but because we're notoriously skeptical of self-report, we decided to come up with an unobtrusive measure of obtrusiveness. And, oh, I forgot to mention, sorry. Um, situation in California, I, had, I have talked to several of you about it. California is a two-party consent state, so you need to be very mindful of recording third parties. So in California, we now have IRB approval to the extent that participants use a button that says, this conversation may be recorded, and we're all legal. So now back to our unobtrusive measure of obtrusiveness. How can we get a sense of how, how um, salient the device was for participants? And what we do is very simple. We code how often they talk about the method in the interactions that we, that we record. And what you see is a very nice um, 
um, curve that, that makes a lot of sense. Initially, they talk about it a lot. They talk a lot about it a lot because we actually instruct them to tell it to, other, to their um, conversation partners, but also because it's on their mind. And you see a very nice habituation so that about um, after about two hours, participants um, talk about it about 1% of the time. So it may occasionally be on their mind, but they forget, forget for large stretches of time because life is busy and life, life goes on. The other question, of course, is, well, yeah, participants, are, they adjust to it, they habituate to it, but what about compliance? How much do people wear the device? Um, interestingly, we promised them that um, we do not listen to the sound files until they are the study to protect the privacy. So in theory, they just could put it somewhere else and we wouldn't even notice until they are out of the study. So it's important to get this. We get self-reported compliance information. We ask them how much they wear it and so on. But again, wouldn't it be nice if we had a behavioral index of compliance? So what we do is we code when people are not wearing the device. And of course, you may wonder, so how would you code from audio when they aren't wearing the device? It is actually quite straightforward. To the extent that there's no background noise whatsoever, no variability, no scratching of clothes, no winds, no cars, no nothing, um, the person is probably not wearing it. And that's exactly what we do. And uh, when we code that, we get um, this kind of um, um, trajectory. You see that initially, non-compliance is very low, so participants are highly motivated, and then they realize, well, I guess the shower is probably not a good, good place to, to, to take the ear, and maybe in sports I should also take it off. So we get a non-compliance that asymptotes roughly somewhere between 10 and 12 percent, which is nice because this is also roughly comparable to what um, experienced sampling researchers get. So at this point, we know that um, we have a methodology that is capable of, of tracking people's behaviors in the natural environment. People habituate to it, and they wear it um, with, with decent compliance. What kind of information can we extract from, from those sound files? Um, so there we um, extract two sources of information about people's natural person environment interaction. We routinely extract information about how people select themselves differentially into certain social environments, and then once they are in that social environment, how they interact in those environments. So um, not everybody goes bun bungee jumping. Some people prefer to be alone. Some people prefer to be in smaller groups. Some people like crowds. Um, that's how people differentially select themselves into environments. There we code location, activity, and interactions. And granted, we are constrained to what we can code from audio. So with respect to location, it's fairly rudimentary. We know maybe is this a private setting, is this a public setting, is the person inside, outside, maybe a coffee shop, restaurant. It is, for psychologists, pretty rudimentary. But we can, we can get that. Of course, mobile sensing devices with GPS can go um, to a very different level at that point. Um, we code basic aspects of activity. Um, whether they listen to music, whether the TV is on, whether they're in church, whether they're going out partying, and so on. Um, so things that we can acoustically detect. And then we code the interaction setting. And, and again, it's pretty basic. We know, is the person alone? Is the person what, in a one-on-one -on -one dyadic interaction, in a group interaction, for what it matters, if it matters um, with a same-sex or an opposite-sex person? Then we go and say, what does the interaction look like? Um, and there we distinguish between topic and, and style. So people talk about certain things and they talk about certain things in a certain way. So we code for topics, relationship, fashion, um, sports, politics, sexuality, of course. And in our student samples, we did that. And what were the top three topics of conversations? Life in the end is pretty boring. It's not politics. Um, it's also not sex. Um, the, the three most uh, prevalent topics of conversations in students were number three, um, entertainment. So broadly defined, sports and going out and everything. Um, number two was, um, fortunately, school. <laughs> and number one, number one that makes all the relationship researchers happy was relationships, also broadly defined. Um, and this is not published because descriptive, de descriptive data is very hard to publish, but I think it, it's kind of interesting. And then in terms of word choice, we use predominantly linguistic inquiry and word count. And again, you will see here right now, um, is, is, is far ahead in, in many ways um, with respect to text analysis, but that was that's what we've used so far. Importantly, <laughs> with a slight flush in my face and embarrassment, um, this is all handmade with care. This is all hand-coded. Um, so we're, we're exploring ways of, of, of automating some of that, but we, we code um, everything by hand. 
Um, how do we code the EFA? So this is, this, is, well, this is what we get. This is actually an, a real transcript from our couples coping with cancer study. So you have the file name which contains the, the couple number and the participant number. We know when the recording was done. And um, we have the transcript and then we have, I mean, we have more categories, but these are just for presentation purposes. Is the person with another person? Yes or no. Is the person talking? Yes or no. Is the conversation cantory? Yes or no. With the significant other, with a friend or acquaintance, and is the TV on? So you see, um, initially they're watching TV, you, you look like you're deep in thought, um, so I bet you're looking forward to having the next last treatment on, t next, uh, on Tuesday. It gets to be a hassle going down there every day and staying there. That's very interesting, so this is obviously cancer related, this is providing support, and the conversation is um, with a significant other while the TV is on. So we, we capture that. As, um, as, as random as life sometimes appears, Nine minutes later, the couple is talking about something very different and saying, I've never seen such stupid commercials. Well, it's got a coating on the outside and you taste it first, and then until that flavor is dissipating, then you get into the other. So you really see the juxtaposition of very, very deep, very meaningful, very important topics to just a lot of trivial, mundane things that are going on in people's life, which I find, I find really fascinating. Um, so why, when you develop a new method, you, you have the burden of proof, the burden of telling people why would you want to, to, to use that. And I can say, well, behavioral observation in the real world sounds good, but it ne we need to ultimately show that the method can do something that other methods cannot do. And so why um, is real world beha um, behavioral observation important? And so I'm gonna just very quickly go through um, four studies that um, highlight some findings um, that we have with respect to four important um, topics in, in psychology with what we can learn about personality from this perspective, what we can learn about gender, what we can learn about well-being and, and about health. So um, let's start with personality. We've, we've, that's actually how our research started. We used the method first to, to look at, at personality. And um, when you give people personality questionnaires, a good old big five question, you do this across cultures, you, get, uh, you can do it at a very large scale. You can do it in the thousands. You just do translation and back translation of the questionnaire and you get very robust findings. For example, you get the very robust finding that um, Americans report being more extroverted than Mexicans. They report being more extroverted, so again, Americans uh, report being more extroverted and more outgoing than Mexicans. And it's a very robust effect in, in, in self-report. Um, that is at, seemingly at odds with, with some of the literature coming out of sociology and anthropology where, where sociability is really one of the core values of, of a Mexican culture. Um, it's also, also slightly at odds with my own experience having traveled to Mexico quite a bit. So we wanted to, to see whether, how the effect would unfold if we went in with a behavioral observation. And so what we did is we did an ear study with 46 students in Monterey, Mexico, and we found a compar comparable sample that was matched in important characteristics um, from the sample that we had from Austin, Texas, 52 students. Um, importantly, this is 46 students and 52 students, this is not thousands of students. Um, so it is true, it's a small sample size. And, and reviewers also um, uh, took, um, took us to charge that, of course, can you really compare Monterey, Mexico to, to Austin, Texas? Well, ultimately not. But on the other hand, both uh, Monterey, Mexico is the second largest city in Mexico. Um, it's roughly comparable in size, actually, to Austin, Texas. We collected the data at a public institution, the public university. They were comparable in age. They were probably middle class. So we, went, we, we did what we could um, to have these two samples. And more importantly, yes, we did replicate that in self-reported extroversion, in self-reported sociability and talkativeness, we found that Americans um, report being significantly more extroverted, sociable, and talkative. When we then went in with the ear, we tried to match up behavioral indicators with a construct we found, interestingly, the exact opposite. We found that in terms of the ear-observed time spent with others socializing and talking, Mexicans spend a lot more time with other people, had more instrumental sociable interactions, and talked more. And then you can argue, well, this is a, it's a little bit like comparing apples with oranges. Extroversion is a very broad construct, um, and your behaviors are very specific, so can we get constructs that are, uh, like variables that are commensurable that you can directly compare? And fortunately, the Big Five inventory has one item that says, I consider myself a talkative person. And we can nicely match that up with how much the person talked. And when we did that, we found that Americans reported being significantly more talkative than Mexicans, but Mexicans actually talked 9% more of the time, and that was highly significant. So 
from there, of course, you need to ask, what is the difference? Where does it come from? Why? And, and very importantly, I, I, this is not to say that, that self-report is wrong and behavior observation is right. There's lots of problems with that. But I think it's really important um, to distinguish culture at the level of the self-construal and culture at the, level, at the level of the daily behavior that is displayed. And you can only study how the two relate together if you can separate them. And, and, and so that's what we try to do there. All right, so um, we have this discrepancy between findings in, at the self-construal level of the behavior for personality. Um, how about in a different variable? So how about gender? Um, there's very pronounced gender stereotypes out there, and it was um, back in, in um, 2006, I believe, that Luanne Brizendine published the book The Female Brain, where she says that a woman uses about 20,000 words per day, while a man uses about 7,000. Um, the numbers she did take out in the second print of it. Um, importantly, all of this is hardwired into the brains of women. These are talents women are born with that many men, frankly, are not. It's kind of an interesting connotative take on, on, on talkativeness, that it's a talent. Usually it tends to be more negatively connotated. So the, the important part here is that, that um, these numbers, and, and Mark Lieberman, who writes the language log, has, has written extensively about it. He went back and, and looked to where they come from. You, you cannot trace them really back. But we all know them, right? And we, know all, we all know the jokes that the, the, the husband comes home after work and has spent, um, um, has spent um, 5,650 words of the 7,000 word budget, and the woman welcomes the husband with 46,000 words left. Um, so so th these are really very prevalent stereotypes, but we do not know how many words men and women actually use. Um, we do know, just like the members and says, it's in the brain. We do know where it is. It's right there. Uh, it's kind of, maybe I should have taken this slide out of the Brain Institute, Brain and Creativity Institute. But um, so we have these very pronounced stereotypes. Um, how does the reality look like? So we, we, we combed through six data sets that we had, um, almost 400 participants, and um, we, it was very simple. We, we knew how many words we counted. We know we record 5% of the time, so you could extrapolate to 100%. When you do that, you get the following distribution. Um, what you see first is that they seem actually quite comparable. So on the right side, we have men. On the left side, we have women. And we have the, the number of words spoken. Um, interestingly, what, what comes to mind second is that the three most talkative individuals are actually men. Um, interestingly, also the least talkative ones. Um, if you look at the means, there is hardly any difference. Um, I say hardly. Um, we estimate for women 16,215 words, for men 15,669 words. Um, this is actually true. There was a comment submitted to science saying, didn't you take your stats 101 class? You cannot confirm a null hypothesis. And in fact, you find evidence. I mean, you, you find that women talk more than men. Of course, that's what we have inferential statistics for. That's what we have effect sizes for. Um, the effect size is trivial. I'm actually kind of happy that this is a study where you don't need inferential statistics. You wouldn't need the p-value, but we can do it. Um, so there is no difference. Um, what's important about that? Um, oh, I, I should not deprive you of, of that. So I. I I say the most talkative individuals are men. Here's an example of our most talkative individual. They, they did it to make a man, I think. Anyways. But um, that's, that's just the kind of stuff that they do. I mean, her mom, it's like they're really nice. Like, some days they're like super nice and all loving and stuff, and then other days it's like, don't even go in that house. But anyway, so she didn't get to go. She was really upset because she'd always wanted to go there. So I kind of surprised her, and I made up a lie saying we were going somewhere else. And... Uh, I was going to take her there, and, and then we got back. This is how it goes, sound file after sound file after sound file. This is when I wish I had automatic transcription. Um, so um, what's important about this is, again, if you ask participants, how talkative are you, which is one of the, the big five inventory questions, you get a very reliable difference. It's not huge, but you get a very reliable difference that women report being more talkative than men. And again, this is not about who's right. This is not about the ultimate answer. but. But this is about the self-construal, and self-construal, of course, is embedded in a culture. And so, and we have here um, the word count, which is kind of artificially taken out. You, I mean, you can speculate interestingly about what talkative really means. Does talkative mean assertiveness? Does talkative mean like chatting? I mean, there's the connotations of that. So it's really interesting things. But you can only study those if you can separate them. That's, I think, the main point. Um, 
Oh, yeah. To me, what, what actually stood out for the study was not necessarily the, the 500 word or the, the very little difference between men and women. That was interesting, but I was, we were actually not the first ones to, to, um, to debunk that stereotype. And there was a meta-analysis conducted afterwards. So to, to me, what's was, was interesting is the huge variability between people. So we had uh, one person that over the course of a day spoke estimated 695 words. That's an abstract in the morning, an abstract at lunchtime, and an abstract in the evening. <laughs> And we had one person that, in the same time period, spoke 47,000 words. It's, it's really, I mean, that makes you want to be a personality psychologist. <laughs> I mean, um, that's, that is really a, a huge individual variability. Um, what also surprised me, honestly, was the responses to this study. So these are taken from the Yahoo um, discussion board. Um, this is from one person who says, what a bogus study. Not only do women talk more than men, they use 10 times as many words to get a point across. Um, this one says, not buying it. You're never going to convince me that men talk as much as women on a daily basis. Whatever method they used for coming up with these results, at best they're flawed. This is what makes you want to just pack up as a scientist and go to the beach. Um, but there were really a lot of emotional responses. This one is, is, is funny. Uh, this is horrible news. I hope that my wife doesn't read this because I never hear the last of it. And, and my absolute favorite uh, in election times is, I want a recount. <laughs> So I, I actually, up to the current date, I, I have a, an answering machine message on my, on my phone from a person that called, identifies himself as a PhD economist, who felt um, compelled to tell me that this is the most disgusting, despicable research ever, and that he was going to call the University of Arizona Administrator to make sure that I do not get tenure. I'm co confident to tenure at this point. But it's really interesting how people, how, how emotionally charged it was. and, and um, but. I think the point is that we, it's hard for us to imagine because our cognitive processing systems process things in one way and the behavioral reality may or may not converge. Okay, how about well-being? So there we wanted to know, can we, do we, can we find behavioral indicators that would robustly be related to people saying, I'm happy, I'm satisfied with my life? This is a collaboration that I, I, I was doing with Simin Vazir, who is now at UC Davis. And what we did is we had a group of about 100 people um, that we extensively ass assessed on, on well-being. We administered traditional um, satisfaction with life scales. We asked them how happy they are to get both of the cognitive component and the affective component. Um, we also, again, because we're notoriously skeptical of self-reports, we asked their friends, how happy do you think your friend is? Um, so we got these friend reports. We threw it all together to have a really robust indicator of, of well-being. And then we wanted to know how um, do aspects of social interactions show up in that. And there, the first indicator we chose was was very crude, was just and, and how much do people talk? And this is, the, many other people have looked at that before, the quality of social interactions with different methodologies, um, and they have found that, that the quality of social interactions is related to, to happiness. And um, we actually uh, replicate that, so this is the amount of time the participants spend alone versus talking to others, and what you see is here's our well-being index and z-scores, and, and here we have the, the, percentage, uh, the, the metric of percentage of time that participants spend alone. And um, well, I can tell you the effect was 0.3. And so this is actually something I, 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 I think is interesting from a methodological standpoint, because we can use these naturalistic observation methods for what, what Lee Seacrest called metric calibration, for understanding what effect sizes really mean in terms of, of, of daily, daily behaviors. So if I told you uh, correlation is 0.30, then um, depending on where you stand in psychology, you could say, wow, it's a really large effect because there's no shared method variance. Or you could say, wow, this is a really tiny effect, 0.3. Everything's related to everything, 0.3, right? So what we can do is right now we can see. So our, ha our happiest person spends an estimated um, amount of almost 40% of the time talking to other people. Our unhappiest person slightly more than 20 so there's a difference of almost 100% between the ha happiest and unhappiest person. Same thing, 80% time al alone, about 60% time alone. That's 20% different. That's really, I mean, I think it, uh, quite a substantial effect. So we replicate prior research showing that the quality of social interaction is replicated to happiness. We then wanted to zoom in and say, can we identify features of that, quality of, of the interaction? Um, and there we focused on, on features that are roughly behaviorally observable. Is this a small talk conversations and we defined it just like the way everybody, lay people do it? Or is this a, 
and there we were lacking good words, a substantive conversation. This is a good conversation. This is a real conversation. There's a topic there. People talk about something that's meaningful and, and substantive. So for the lack of a better word, we, we chose to call it a substantive conversation. And we again linked it how it's related to happiness. And we found very robustly that happy people reported having less small talk and more substantive conversation. So um, again, the effect is around 0.3. That's interesting, but I find it interesting to look at really the, the differences between the happy and the unhappy people. So our unhappiest person had an estimated amount of 30% of the conversations were small talk. Our happiest person, 10%. That's a third of that. Our unhappiest person had about 20% substantive conversation. Our happiest person, twice that much. Or phrased differently, sadly, our unhappiest person had more small talk conversations over the course of a day than, than substantive conversations. Um, so I think this is a way to, to grasp these effects. And again, if you had asked it all in self-report, you could and you can get valuable information. But on the other hand, you always run the risk that you have shared method variants and people who um, show response biases on reporting on happiness also may say, well, I'm actually very integrated. I have, I have good friends. I have tons of friends. So I think it's just um, the absence of shared method variants strengthens the, the, the effect. So we can conclude that the happy daily life is social rather than solitary and maybe conversationally deep rather than superficial. Finally, with respect to health, and this is very new data um, that's um, coming out of um, a collection of laboratories where we looked at the um, quality interaction of, of interaction and inflammatory activity, and we do that in collaboration with two of my colleagues at the University of Arizona, um, Dick Bootsen and Dave Sabara, and we also do it um, um, in another study with um, Charles Rizan, who's a psychoimmunologist, um, Ted Pace, both psychoimmunologists, and um, the local Steve Cole, who is at UCLA and does a lot of um, immunological work at the level of the gene expression. So what we find is that this same marker of substantive conversation that we had linked to well-being, um, we find that this marker in a very small pilot study is related to lower IL-6 levels and, and um, a functional marker of a marker of uh, functional um, inflammation. And so um, this is only 20 people. This is a very small size. We were encouraged by that, but we wanted to see whether we find it in a different, um, a different sample. In a different sample, we did not have IL-6, but we had um, Steve Cole's um, measures of inflammatory activity at the level of the gene expression. And we had a much larger sample. And so we found, again, that the same measure of um, substantive conversation, the percentage of conversations that are substantive, related um, negatively to inflammatory gene expression. So this is, um, this is correlation, and correlation is not causation, so we don't know what it means. Um, it could mean that a good conversation has anti-inflammatory properties, but it could also obviously mean that um, inflammation, and we know that, and inflammation has socially disconnecting properties. Um, um, so there's, there's a lot of research, obviously, on, on, um, on that as well. So finally, because I, I know that there's a lot of researchers um, here at USC who, who do work on morality, I wanted to present some data that's um, also unpublished and it's also very new um, that we're very excited about, where we wanted to study interpersonal kindness or interpersonal virtuous behavior, morality in daily life. And this is a collaboration, again, with Samin Vazir and, uh, from, from uh, UC Davis and John Doris from um, Washington University. It was funded by um, the John Templeton Foundation. So what we did for this project, um, we, we had the goal of, of studying hum, like human kindness um, um, in its natural habitat. And um, Jesse Graham wrote a wonderful um, perspectives piece in science recently where he, he said that um, morality needs to move out of the lab into, into the natural environment. We do not, we, we certainly, we cannot claim to be comprehensive in our, in our ear assessment of morality. We have a thin slice of it but the purpose was very much the same, to take um, the behavior into the natural environment. We also had a second focus. We wanted to study um, virtuous behavior in daily life, and we wanted to study, therefore, from this perspective of everyday, ordinary moral behavior. This is not the mother jumping or a person jumping into the river to help somebody survive. These are the, the major moral acts, right? But a lot of our lives is, I mean, um, like Kenneth, K Kenneth, Kenneth Craig said, um, lives are lived day by day, day in, day out, from day to day, one day at a time. Uh, our lives uh, happen every day, and they're in many ways very, very mundane. So if, if I've learned something about um, daily life from this year research, that a lot of our, 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 our daily lives consist of these very ordinary, mundane tasks that we engage in. They're not meaningless, certainly not, because they are the, 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 
founding blocks of, 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 of who we are and what we do, but these are, well, with the, with the words of our own participants, the little things in life, and, and they matter. <laughs> So this actually, we, we were fortunate to get that from the actual stream of daily life. This was not an interview. And um, so it, it expressed the idea just in a really nice way. So we had a um, database that we used for the study, four samples um, consisting of a mixture of healthy adults and clinical samples, um, 76 healthy adults from an ongoing meditation study, 13 and 12 arthritis patients, and our breast cancer patients and, and, and partners. They differed slightly in sampling rate. They differed slightly in how many days we sampled. Um, but we had a total of um, 190 participants and more than 25,000 real-world situations, so waking sound files that we, that we could code. <laughs> All of the sound, sound files were triple-coded because when you get to these psychological ca categories, double-coding sometimes doesn't do the job. Um, and again, we thank the Templeton Foundation for the funding. Um, they, we, we employed binary coding, so we didn't do the degree to which there was the behavior present, just was the behavior present or not. Um, we restricted our codings of kindness to interpersonal behavior, to social interactions. At times, it may be that the person may be displaying kindness without talking. That's just really hard for us to get. And, and even theoretically, I guess one could argue that the interpersonal aspect is the one that's most important. Um, and so our measure then reflects the percentage of interactions where a certain behavior was present. And we pool the results across the four samples for the moment until we learn better ways, ignoring the dependency in the breast cancer patients and the partners, which of course reduces the effective degrees of freedom. But I need to find out ways to deal with it. I don't want to throw 50 away just because then we have independent data points. Um, these are the behaviors that we coded. We had kind or virtuous daily behavior. We coded showing empathy, sympathy, concern. So just once to, to be mindful of it, this is not experiencing empathy, sympathy, concern. This is expressing it, um, showing affection, um, showing gratitude, again, there's a lot of research on experiencing gratitude. This is the display of gratitude. People may experience gratitude much more often. This is when they display it, offering praise, making compliments, expressing hope, optimism, and apologizing. And so here we have uh, one more example of a person um, making a compliment. This is from our breast cancer sample. It is indeed. You're cute today. I've heard you are. And you look cute in that outfit. So you, it's just kind of a nice, nice little interaction that they have. But I think it shows that we, we there is not very much mindfulness going off of wearing the device. And then we try to get the vice part as well, the, the unkind part. So we coded blaming, being sarcastic, being condescending or arrogant, complaining, whining, criticizing, and bragging. And then we looked at those behaviors. And uh, usually I have to say that I, I, it's hard to, to try to find order in the messiness of daily life. But, but here, um, the first finding that we got that I'm actually quite excited about and in some way quite surprised is that kindness um, seems to come really as a relatively nice package. So when you do, when you correlate all those variables, you um, can create what one could call a kindness cluster that has actually a decent alpha. In fact, it analytically hangs together nicely and it consists of empathy, affection, gratitude, praise, and optimism. Apologizing didn't fit nicely in there, but it also makes sense because it's really a different level. There has to be something else going on before, so, so it kind of makes sense. So all the findings that I'm gonna talk about right now are not gonna be at the level of the individual behavior, affection or gratitude, but at the level of this broader um, kindness cluster. The second finding um, is, um, Kind of nice finding has, has been found before in positive psychology, um, makes probably humans happy. Kindness um, beats unkindness in everyday life three to one. So when you look at the base rate of these behaviors, we see empathy 5.9% uh, of the time, affection 4.1% of the time, uh, off the conversation, sorry, praise 37 So that's because we do these binary codings, our metric lends itself nice to interpretation um, in terms of the percentage of conversations in which empathy was, was expressed. When you look at the unkind behavior, they, they mostly go below 1%, so they're much more, um, much less prevalent, except criticizing. Apparently, um, we, we criticize um, people quite a bit. Um, then you can ask, how does this index relate to um, 
sociodemographic variables. And, and we know a lot about this already, um, but we can use this essentially to validate the index. So how does it relate, for example, to gender? Um, here is the distribution across the three samples. We find a robust difference, gender difference. Women are, behave more kindly as measured by this index than men. This is something that other people have found with other methods. I find it kind of interesting that, that when you look at the distributions, you actually see, it seems like women have more kind exemplars. I mean, things that are really at the outlier, whereas the bulk of the distribution is actually quite comparable. But this is a robust effect. This is a pretty strong effect and replicates prior, prior findings. How about age? Do people get nicer or grumpier as they, as they age? Um, this is also not, this is construct validation. This is not, I'm not doing science here. Laura Carstens and many people have, have done research on that and have found what we in essence find. Um, we do find that um, people do not get grumpier as they age. This is cross-sectional. Um, but that age is positively related to our kindness index. Again, the effect is, is for, uh, for a behavioral index actually quite, um, quite appreciable, I think. So um, we can use this to kind of gain confidence in, in the index that, that we develop and can then go further and ask, okay, so what are inter, interpersonal correlates of kindness um, as measured by these variables? So let's take um, positive emotions. This is um, expressions of positive, positive emotions as measured by linguistic inquiry and word count positive emotion words. And what we find, again, this is not rocket science because of course, our observers that coded that, they used the verbal information in their codings, um, but people who are higher, score higher on the kindness used a lot more positive words. Again, what's, you can grasp the, the effect sizes quite nicely. You have a little more than 2%, 2.5%, then you have uh, 4%, so it's, it's roughly um, like a maybe 60% increase between the um, unkind and the kind. Um, you can then ask how about anger expressions, kind people should express less anger. In daily life, this is measured Again, Luke anger words derived from the transcripts of those conversations that we sampled from daily life. So these are actual conversations, actual anger expressions, verbal and anger expressions, verbal only. And um, overall, it's good news. We don't express too much anger. About less than 1% of our, our words that we use are anger expressions. Um, and we find a very nice um, negative relationship with the, the highest, highest um, kindness people using really just not much beyond, a little bit beyond zero, but not that much. Um, finally, we can look at um, other aspects that go beyond the emotional expression, say sociability, for example. So we have here the degree to which people mention friends. And, and I know that um, Mortesa's group is, is working on improving that dictionary because that dictionary I don't think is particularly trustworthy, but it counts words as companion, friends, buddy, and so on. And people who are kind reference friends more often suggesting in an indirect way that they may be more sociable. So you can look at that then more systematically. And what we find is these two arms of everyday kindness. We find that everyday kindness as measured by our index relates, um, is related to, to more other focused positive emotion, emotionality. So we find that they laugh more significantly, they use more positive emotions, they swear less, and they use less anger. Um, and again, some of that has a bit shared method variance um, because these are the, the information that the coders had at hand. Um, and we find as the second arm of kindness um, that it correlates um, robustly with a more meaningful social connectivity as measured by more socializing, more in, in non-instrumental interactions of, a, of an informal nature, more disclosure conversations, and also more substantive conversations, which is, which is again the exact same construct we used for the happiness research and for the inflammation studies. Interestingly, we do find these, these pretty um, substantial in interpersonal correlates. And you look at intrapersonal correlates, um, well, we certainly, I confess, we did have pretty clear expectations that people who are kinder are happier and less depressed and, um, and less stressed. And there, so these are the, we do have all of these measures. Um, we have um, the perceived stress scale, we have depression measures, we have satisfaction with life. And I was slightly underwhelmed by those, by those correlations. Um, I, I don't know. I, th this does um, seemingly at least contradict some of the other research on gratitude, but again, we need to say there's experienced gratitude, there's expressed gratitude. Um, it also minimizes shared method variance. Um, that could be another reason. So I do not really know, but it seems for the moment, in our sample at least, that there is no clear immediate in, um, intrapersonal correlate to it. And um, I'd be very happy to hear speculations as to why we might, might get this discrepancy within our data and also with respect to other researchers. To summarize, um, 
mobile sensing with methods such as the ear and other, um, other methods that are coming out of computer science allows studying important psychological behaviors objectively, in vivo, and ultimately at large scale. I mean, the ear is kind of moderate scale if you want so. Um, mobile sensing can help fill the conspicuous naturalistic observation gap in psychology, which I think is really there and really, really important. And Roger Barker was, was foundational in doing that, and, and there was really not that much after that. Um, except, again, like UCLA has that. There is, there's centers out there that do that. In fact, UC, USC also is, is doing it. So I think we're, we're noticing it and we're trying to, to address that. It allows studying actual real-world behavior in addition to global, retrospective, or momentary perceptions of, of, of such behaviors. And also importantly, it can provide an unprecedented, unprecedentedly high temporal and contextual resolution. So we can really do at a very fine-grained level because we don't add burden to participants and we can get environmental situational features um, at, a, at a high resolution, which I think is important for understanding person um, situation interactions. So the big picture, finally, what my research really is concerned with is this triangle of personality, social environment, and health. So we have people that move about in their lives in, in environments, and those environments have, have consequences and are mostly interested in mental and physical health consequences. So we're having a series of studies going on right now. So, so one that we just completed and that I, I mentioned um, to, to many of you is our Couples Coping with Cancer project. We wanted to know how life is um, as you go through cancer treatment, as you di diagnosed and, and treated with cancer. How does it change your social environment and how is that related to health? Um, this was in collaboration with Karen Weiss and, and Dr. Lopez, uh, uh, um, an oncologist in, in Arizona. We're having another study that we're about to wrap up, a really major study um, funded by the National uh, uh, Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, where we look at the effects of meditation, specifically compassion meditation, on people's behavior. The idea is very simple. We, tr um, we have um, standardized um, compassion meditation training. Um, you juxtapose that against uh, a made, uh, mindfulness meditation training and a control group. And we wanted to see, do, does compassion meditation training make you more compassionate? Does it make you express less anger, more positive emotions, laugh more, all of these behaviors that we can readily assess? We're in the final stages of data collection um, of coding. We'll probably know the answer to that early, early in the spring. This is in collaboration with Dr. Raison and Dr. Pace from the University of Arizona um, and Gishe Lopsang at, from, at, at Emory University. Um, finally, we have another um, project um, funded by National Institute of, of Child Health and Human Development with Dr. Bootsen, who's a sleep researcher, and Dr. Zabara, a clinical psychologist, where we look at adjustment to divorce, where we get people um, after um, they've undergone a relationship separation, and we track them at, at multiple channels, at subjective stress, social environment, and sleep over time, and we can model where the changes in sleep behavior lead to changes in social behavior, lead to changes in, in adjustment, or whether social changes uh, lead sleep changes and, and lead um, adjustment changes, so we can track those um, trajectories over time. Um, with that, I wanted um, to thank, first and foremost, um, you for the invitation. I wanted to thank, very importantly, also our participants for lending us, uh, allowing us to, to listen in on their daily lives, and all the, the grad students, current and former, and collaborators and research assistants that have worked on the project. The research assistants have done a tremendous job in transcribing and coding thousands and thousands of sound files. Thank you. Questions? So we would, we would need the other perspective, like in the cancer study, to see how much there is responsibility for <coughs> what's going on. Very, very good point. Yeah, so we could do that in that subsample. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that a couple of practical questions. One is, can you now get location information now that you have on the, the iPhone? Uh, the latest version of the ear does have GPS. The IRBs are not particularly fond of it. Um, 
but we can do it now. We have not done it. Do you mean have we over time seen that it, that it becomes less obtrusive? Well, but what well, you're saying like your compliance yeah. first was yeah. like 12% of yeah. that was presumably like the PDAs. Yeah. Is it better like with smartphones or? Um, I, I, it could be. Uh, that would be a nice idea. I, I think it's just they, they still have to carry an extra device. We still not don't use their own smartphones, and we can go into why. Oh. So in some way, I don't think it changes. But what, what the, the, the strongest determinant that I've seen actually is the degree to which the study matters to you. So ironically, this was based on our student samples. We now do a lot of clinical samples, arthritis patients, cancer patients, and we actually get better compliance because somehow we need the buy-in. We need to explain to them why we do that, why we track them as they, I mean, we're not, I mean, we, we don't try to intrude. We're not trying to, to, to sneak into their life. So why do we do this? And when, when we get them on board, we get actually very good compliance, better than with students. Okay. Well, so, so the, I guess the, the culture study would, would argue that you do and the gender study would do, but it's kind of an unfair comparison, right? If Arthur Stone were here right now, he would, he would obviously point out that this is not experience sampling. I mean, in all cases, in fact, I've not compared momentary observation to momentary self-reports. Um, so that answer needs to, needs to wait until Gayla analyzes her, her, her data. Um, <laughs> because she actually does have experience sampling and, and the ear and observational. Um, I, I think then, other than that, I would just argue it depends on the behavior. We, for example, I, mean, I see no reason to do an ear study for how much people watch TV. You just ask them, right? Um, I see no reason to do an ear study for where they wear. I see no reason to do an ear study for um, maybe even for how much they interact. I mean, the Rochester Interaction Record does a great job with that, right? I do see a, a purpose very much so if you go, the more you go to these automatic subtle behaviors, like for example, we, we, we have a study on sign where we, where we uh, link sign to negative affect and we find it's a very strong um, marker of depression. In fact, this is in, in the arthritis sample and if you look at the literature, sign is in the arthritis literature usually taken as a pain marker. It's, an, it's a marker of pain, a pain behavior. And we show that it relates more strongly to depression than it relates to, to pain. That I think would you wouldn't. Laughing, um, the verbal, the verbal behavior. So I think I'm, I'm the first one very happy to grant a large territory to, to experience sampling. And I mean, that's why, I mean, the handbook, I think we, we try to balance this out. It's, it's complementing. It's, it's very, it's, it's the same. When would you do? When would you bring couples to the lab rather than asking them in an EMA way or in a global way? The, the criteria are the same, I think. Other questions? Uh, the answer is it wasn't up until 2014. So it was periodic due, <laughs> due to my lack of computational uh, the two programmers, but we now have randomization. So you can now set the percentage of randomization. So if you set it at 100%, it's truly random. If you set it at 50%, it guarantees you half of the period, no recordings and randomizes within that, which is what experience sampling does with, we're saying um, we do it in blocks, but you need a, a certain space in between. So it's very comparable. It will help immensely. <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 we do the, I have to confess, we do the hand coding with confidence um, and, we, and we do it with grant funding. So because I think many of the behaviors are really hard to get. But having said that, I would, I, I, any behavior that I can begin to automate, I would ha happily take. So one of the, the, the things that I, I've mentioned to several of you is it would be, it must be possible at this point to detect whether there's anybody talking in the sound files. Just the, the percentage of frames, whether there is any voiced frame or not, or the percentage of voiced frames. That 
saves us. So two thirds of our lives are boring. No social interactions. Our social life is really restrained to a third of the time. So if we can zoom in, if we can have a, have a so the ear comes with a lock file. It locks time of recording, battery, and all that. If we could lock percentage of voiced frames in there, or we'll get it afterwards, doesn't matter. We recorders could probably reasonably skip all the other files. It, it's it's not really important, and we save two thirds of the time. And then we we talked in fact about other things you could get without going into the nitty gritty details of speaker separation and all of that. Where it gets tricky, whether this is a one on one interaction, two people talking, two voices, more than two voices, doable. Maybe the gender of the voices, probably possibly doable. So we could we could I think go step by step and get actually quite quite far. Mm -hmm. Just one comment about that. I think if all the main variables in Sonos, like Google Glass, like I don't know, even iWatch, it would be very interesting to try and to integrate these together. Like the, the person is talking to another person with the picture in this moment can show that they're still in an interaction. So it would be. Um, yes. So I, I would be very interested to, to combine it with physiological measures, let it be the Apple Watch or let it be other things that, that are already being used. I would be, I could be convinced that we should add picture to that, but I, I would have quite some reservations to be honest. Um, and there is, there is actually um, Ryan Sherman at University of Florida uh, wants to use it and, and a couple of people also. There's a really cool tool so called LifeLocker. Um, it's, a, it's a little button thing that you can clip on. It takes um, pictures every 30 seconds. It automatically archives it, arranges it. It would be really cool. And we could, we could add it. Um, the challenge I see is it's information that still, well, actually, with signal processing, we could probably get something automatically out of that. But if you add more hand coding, you code even more. And the other thing is you just potentiate all the third party concerns. So we didn't talk, there was no questions about IRB and about all of that. Um, we, we, we have obviously consider that and the button is there, but the, the, the goal is to make third parties least identifiable. That's the premise. Um, so if we do the picture and we point the camera out, we, we potentiate that. Having said that, Ryan Sherman actually has IRB approval in Florida. This is kind of a funny story. He has IRB approval in Florida for the life logger, but he didn't get IRB approval for the ear. <laughs> I don't think that automatic transcription is there. Um, I mean, Sri would be the person to answer that, but I think even in, in your lab, there's a lot of, I mean, you, you get, uh, people, people say you get to 80% accuracy. Um, I think that's under fairly good conditions. I would suspect that if you have overlapping speakers and background noises, you get to less. Um, then, of course, from a computer science standpoint, you may, well, you may run your topic models or your dictionaries on 70% accuracy, and it may or may not actually matter. That's an empirical question, um, but so far we hand transcribe. <laughs>